Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our study on the life of David. Today, we're going to conclude our study by looking at lesson 22 and 23, David and Solomon and David's promise, David's promise given to him by God. We're going to combine these two lessons as we wrap up our study today, and I, I hope that your time throughout this study, if you've been able to go through the lessons, uh, that it's been a blessing to you, that maybe you've learned some things you haven't learned before, uh, that you've been helped and encouraged by the example of of David. You've maybe witnessed some some great traits and qualities in David's life that you'd like to imitate and and emulate in your own life, or maybe you've just been impressed with the the journey of David and his story, and just uh, found found great hope and, and comfort in in what we read through this text. It's a very reward, rewarding study because there's few people in the Bible that we could say are are similar to David. David is uh, the man after God's own heart, and he's called that for, for a reason. He's an incredible man of faith who put his trust in the Lord and served God in, in so many wonderful ways. Well, what we're looking at today, David, when he becomes old, uh, even though he is still king, in his mind, he knows who the next king is going to be. But he has a son whose name is Adonijah, and he decides that he's going to take the throne of David. He's going to do what he can to go ahead and just secure the throne. And so he gathers a plan. He gathers his supporters. Left out of that grouping, though, is Nathan the prophet. And Nathan, out of his wisdom, goes to Bathsheba. Bathsheba goes to David and pleads for David to to look into this matter, to consider what's going on, that people are saying Adonijah is king, and Adonijah is, is declaring himself the king, and David David acts swiftly and promptly. He knows the right people to, to call into action. He knows the next steps that Solomon must take, and that, that plan of Adonijah's to secure the throne, to take the throne, rather than waiting for David to choose, um, is quickly foiled. It does not come about. David, in his wisdom, though he is old, David, in his wisdom, knew how to squash this rebellion and to secure his choice and really God's choice for the throne, and that is Solomon. In fact, you, you'll see that David reaches out to Solomon in First Kings chapter two, verses one and four, and he really gives him some incredible instruction. He reminds Solomon to be strong. Be strong. Show yourself a man. You know, a lot of times God's leaders, before they step into those kind of roles, we hear that kind of a charge. Be strong and courageous. We think of Joshua and how God and Moses said to Joshua, I want you to be strong and courageous. You're going to lead God's people into, into the promised land. Well, here, David tells Solomon, you need to be strong and show yourself a man. You're, you're stepping into an incredible position with great responsibilities. That's both rewarding and sobering. Um, there, there's a sense in which you're stepping into something that God has given and I have secured for you. A kingdom that is strong, that is wealthy, that is well positioned for greatness. And so, yes, that is a blessing, but it's a blessing that comes with the burden of responsibility. That you must rise to the challenge and lead this nation in the ways of the Lord. And that's why he tells him to observe what the Lord your God requires and to walk in obedience to God. Keep his decrees, his commandments his laws, and his regulations. In other words, the greatness that you're going to find going forward, Solomon, is if you continue to walk in the paths of the Lord, that you listen and learn and obey the Lord and what wise words from his father, from his father about this role he's stepping into and the ways that he can, that he can and will find great success found in walking with God. Well, that takes us then to our last study, and that's lesson 23 and David's promise. We're going back in time a little bit to conclude here, and that is back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Chronicles chapter 7. At this time, it was a good time in David's life. Uh, David was walking with the Lord. He was thinking about God. He was honoring God. Uh, he wanted to build the temple. Uh, David was a king over a unified Israel and was experiencing great military success. His family was growing. He had wives. He had children. It's just, it's a great time in David's life. And it's in this time that God sends Nathan the prophet with an important message to David. It's a promise that God is making to David, a covenant that he's establishing with David. He begins, if you look down to verses 8 through 11, he begins his covenant with David speaking about past, present, and future. 
about his blessings and care of David. How he took David as the shepherd out shepherding the sheep to, to the throne. The shepherd, not sheep, but the shepherd Israel, the shepherd, the people. From a shepherd to a king. And wherever David has gone, God has cut off his enemies. Through God, David has defeated a lion and a bear. Through God, he's defeated Goliath. Through, through God, he has defeated numerous Philistines as a warrior in Saul's army. And then now as a king, all these many nations that David has found great military success in. Through God, David now has a great name, an immense reputation. I mean, not only at this time was, was David's name great, you know, you think about that song that was sung of David when he was a young man, how he slain his ten thousands, uh, the, the reputation among Israel. It, it was a reputation that went out outside of Israel. The other nations knew about David. The other nations uh, respected David and his, and, and his favor that he had received from the Lord. But David's name does not just remain as it is, as great and powerful and and, and well fortified in his time. It's a name that continues to be known and respected through time because good kings, good kings from here forward are held to the standard of David. Either they walk in the ways of David or they walk in the ways of Jeroboam. Jeroboam is kind of the standard of evil until Ahab kind of comes along. And then David is the standard of greatness in God's, in terms of God's leaders. Well, this, though, um, through God, through God's blessings, through God's provision, David will have a house, a family, a legacy, a dynasty. This is all before his sin. This promise that God is giving here is all before his sin with Bathsheba. The sin and the sword which will devour his house. But it's interesting, if you look in verse 10, it's interesting that this promise and covenant is rooted in the promise that's given to Abraham. God has kept those promises, the promise that he made all those years ago, and God would continue to keep any promises that he would make, including the promises he's making here to David. This reminds us of the way that God saw David. What love and what kindness and what grace and what favor. God greatly cared for David. He saw him, as we describe him, as a man after his own heart. Well, what is that promise found here in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16? What, what's being described? Really, maybe the question is, who is being described? Because God promised that David would have a descendant who would reign on the throne. Verse 12, that God would establish his kingdom. Verse 13, that he will build a house for God, a temple. Verse 13, that God would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14, that I will be a father to him. And he will be a son to me, and he will correct him like a father does a son. That God will correct him like he does like he does a son. In verse 15, that his loving kindness or mercy, the mercy of the Lord will not depart from him. And verse 16, that your house and your kingdom will endure forever. A lot of great descriptions about one of David's descendants. Who could this possibly be? Who is God describing here? Well, one of the descendants being described here quite quite obviously, as, as we're looking in terms of history, has got to be Solomon. I mean, he is the one who's going to take the throne after David. He's the one who's going to build a temple for God. He's he's the one who, who has a good, close relationship with God. When you look at what's said in 1 Kings 3 and verse 3, and, and even though he had a, a close relationship with God, God had to correct him. If you look at 1 Kings 11, 11 to 13, how his heart was stolen by the many women in his life. Even though he was close with God, God had to to correct him like a father would a child. And so in many ways, this this descendant of David that is giving all these promises, the promises are pointing to this descendant, in many ways it's, it seems to be pointing to Solomon. And yet, in some ways, we also see a descendant long in the future to come. We see Jesus, how God established his kingdom. We see Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 8. How Jesus is building the spiritual temple, not made of stones and mortar, but made of, of the hearts and lives of his people. We are the living stones, First Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. The throne of Jesus that he reigns, reigns, uh, reigns upon now, is established forever, Colossians 1 and verse 13. The discipline, perhaps. You wonder, well, what about the discipline and the correction? What do you think of what, what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6? That it pleased the Father to 
to please him, to crush him for the iniquities of sins of the people. Father and Son relationship surely exists between Jesus and, and God the Father. And his house and kingdom shall reign forever. It's what's echoed in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and verse 9. And so, while in some sense the promise seems to be pointing to an immediate fulfillment in Solomon, in other ways these promises continue to be to be pushed to the future as they are fulfilled not in Solomon, but in Christ, in Jesus. Now the fulfillment took some interesting turns through time because in the reign of David's grandson, Rehoboam, God tore away the ten tribes of David's house because of idolatry. And so Rehoboam's wicked son, Abijam, was spared because of God's promise to David. 1 Kings 15, verses 3 through 5. Three generations later, Judah suffered through, uh, through the reign of Jeroram, uh, Ahab's son-in-law. And yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant he made, because of this promise at 2 Chronicles 21, verse 7. Joram's widow, Athaliah, destroyed all the royal offspring, but overlooked one baby that was hidden in the temple. 2 Kings chapter 11 records that story. Later on, God rescued his people from the powerful Assyrian army. 2 Kings 19, verses 33 to 35. Then eventually, their wickedness uh, forced God to remove David's descendants from the throne. See Ezekiel 21. Verses uh, 26 and 27. But God used Babylon to chop down his nation, if you will. Get the language. Get the idea. He, to chop down the nation. To chop down this fortified kingdom that had been built. When the time looked bleak, one writer lamented, Where is your loving kindness? Psalm 89, verse 49. The Babylonians came in. And it seemed like all was lost, all was forgotten, all was forsaken. Where is the mercy of the Lord? But God promised that a shoot would, would come forth from that felled tree. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, he promised to rebuild the fallen temple, the fallen tabernacle of David. Amos 9 verses 11 through 15. And men and women of faith continue to to look forward to the coming of the everlasting kingdom of David's son. If you look at Luke 2, 25, uh, Luke 2, verse 38, Luke 23, verse 51, the faithful were looking forward to the restoration of David's, of the kingdom that David, God has established through David. And finally, Gabriel announces Jesus, who will be given the throne of his father, David. That's Luke 1, 32 through 33. And so Jesus descends from David and rules as king in Christ that the fallen tabernacle of David has been rebuilt and we can be a part of the everlasting kingdom today. Just notice some of these references. You can read them when you get the chance. Mark 11, 9 and 10. Luke 1, 68 through 71. Acts 2, 25 through 36. Acts 15, verses 14 through 18. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, we, we, we just see this, that Jesus has descended from, from the family, from the lineage of David, reigns as a king, has restored that broken tabernacle, and today, today those who submit their lives to his gospel call can be part of this everlasting, unfading kingdom that belongs to Christ. Now, that's the promise that was given to David. What an immense promise, isn't it? What an incredible promise to be given to David about this, this incredible, everlasting rule and reign that his name would be remembered, that God would make him great, and that there will be a descendant who will bring even, even greater blessing, even greater prosperi uh, prosperity spiritually for God and the people, for God's people. Well, how does David respond to this promise? Well, there's aspects that stand out from his response. Look at verse 18, when he says, Who am I? Who am I? What, what is my house to receive such favor, such a promise? You see the humility of David. You see the praise of God. This is nothing for you. You are great. There's no one like you. You have done great things. Verse 19, verse 22, and verse 23. You see the focus purely on God. Fulfill these things that your name may be magnified. Verse 26. The greatness of Israel and of David is to God's glory. 
not to his own. Uh, there's a boldness in David to ask God to fulfill these things and to bring them about in verse 26 and 27. Uh, David could come confidently, boldly before the throne, realizing this incredible relationship that he was in with his God. Now you think about this, what, what would it take to have a response like this today? To be able to respond to God and his promises and his words, what would it take for us to have this kind of a response today? Well, it may begin with an understanding of, of who we are and what we have and how it's all from God, and that my life's purpose is to give God the honor and glory that he deserves. And whatever greatness may be found in my life is to the thanks and praise and honor and glory of God. It takes a heart that's focused on God, and just how wonderful he is, and how wonderful, uh, how gracious he is, and how, how incredibly, how incredibly kind, how incredibly generous, how incredibly thoughtful and, and, and merciful God has been to me to give me all that I have and to offer an abundantly uh, abundantly more than what I have promised for, for us, for those who, who follow him in heaven. What it really takes is a close relationship with God. To have this kind of a response like David's, it, it comes from a close relationship with, of, with God. You think of Hebrews chapter 4, how the writer tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace with confidence. And that just comes with a close relationship, a good, solid, close relationship with God, a, a habit of, of knowing God through his word, of, of drawing near to him in prayer every day, daily in thought and in tune with God. And that's who David was ever since he was a, a young boy in those fields of Israel. His heart was already in tune with God, thinking, dreaming, singing, praising God, even from his youth. Well. In God's promise to David, we see, we see Jesus. If you think back just for a minute, and you think over the life of David, how do you see, how do you see Jesus? Where do we see Jesus in in the life of David? Well, you might see some similarities between the traits of David and of Christ, the courage of David, seen in the, in the courage of Christ. The, the faith of David, how very God-focused David was. Now, Christ came to, to do the Father's will above all. You might see some very specific similarities, how both of them walked up the Mount of Olives in mourning. Uh, how both were born in Bethlehem. Both were shepherds. Both experienced confrontations or temptations in the wilderness. Both were kings. Both died in Jerusalem. Both were betrayed by someone who was close to them. And so there are a lot of similarities between David and, and between Jesus. And yet there's something as we conclude. Something that I think is, is endearing about the life of David. He points us to Jesus and he shows us the one who really is great. But you know what's great about David is that he was just a man. He was just a man. A man like you and a man like me. And that's what James would say about Elijah. He's a man with a nature like ours. And that's David. He was just a man. A man who, who loved his God. A man who was said of him in Acts 13 and verse 36. As, as great as David is and all the incredible things he did, the most simple summary of David's life is Acts 13 verse 36. That he served the purpose of God in his generation. David did what he was asked to do by God. And he served the purpose of God. As a shepherd. As a... As a warrior, as a king, David served the purpose of God. And in doing so, because of his faith, because of his commitment, because of his, his dedication to God and his purposes, he is called a man after God's own heart. And I think, I think that's, worth, that's worth pursuing. Am I seeking the purpose of God? To do what it is I can do in my generation. God, God made us to be alive here and now. He didn't purpose for us to be alive in the days of Abraham or in the days of Paul, but to be alive now. And so am I seeking with the best of my ability to serve and fulfill the purpose of God here and now? And am I striving to have a heart, a heart like his? A heart, no, not just like David's, because David's heart is like God's heart. Are we striving to have a heart like God, a heart that's holy and righteous, and pure, that seeks good, that is 
touched and full, overflowing with mercy and compassion, a heart that seeks always to do the things that are pleasing, that bring honor and glory to the one that really matters to him. What did you learn this quarter from the life of David? It'd be a great time to think and reflect, to maybe even say a prayer, thanksgiving to God for this incredible example recorded for us in God's words. To say thank you, Lord, for your servant David and how he helps us and continues to to inspire us even today. Thank you so much for studying with me. Come on back to our website. We're going to have more, more classes and more studies coming up this next quarter. And until then, have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing you again soon.